I'm Michael. And I'm Landon. And this is In Their 20s, the best podcast for people in their 20s. Today we spoke with Kevin Bain, the co-CEO and co-founder of the Boca Restaurant Group, which is a globally recognized restaurant empire. Over the past 27 years, Kevin has opened over 30 restaurants. He has so much experience and leadership and hard work and resilience. So before we dive in, make sure you're subscribed to our page on YouTube so we can continue to make amazing content that will inspire you to take charge of tomorrow. All right, Michael, you ready? Let's jump in. Being in Chicago and having gone to school in Chicago, seeing the influence that you've had and uh, the empire that you've built, um, it's really amazing. So we're excited to speak with you today. Well, there are very humble beginnings in my 20s. So, we'll yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, just like that, we'll start with the beginning because we saw, Kevin, that yeah. uh, you've opened 30 restaurants over the last 27 years. Uh, that all began in your 20s. So when one day someone decides to make the Kevin Bame documentary, we want to know from the beginning, uh, how did this all get started? All right. Well, so, you know, I, I, I was born in Flint, Michigan. I grew up in Springfield, Illinois. Uh, I, I don't know if you want me to go back that far or not, but, uh, uh, you know, my, my mom worked in retail. My dad worked in a little tiny insurance company. I know, grew up, grew up middle class, but at 10 years old, for some unknown reason, I told my parents that I wanted to own my own restaurant, which is kind of strange. My parents were not social people. They weren't particularly into food. My mom had grown up on a farm, but for some reason I liked the idea of throwing a party every night, a bunch of people coming, hosting it, you know, cleaning it up and then doing the same thing again the next day. So, um, but by the time I was 18 years old, uh, I knew nobody that was in the restaurant business. Um, I didn't really have a sense of what being a restaurant tour truly was. And I just, I went to college like everybody else. I went to University of Illinois. I, I, I was thinking about becoming a lawyer. Um, and something pivotal happened right before I turned 20. Uh, two of my housemates, one was uh, Mike Hopkins, who was the last American astronaut in space. He's actually leading the SpaceX mission right now, was one of my housemates. And another one was Dave Eggers. And Dave Eggers, famous writer, started McSweeney's, wrote two Tom Hanks movies, finalists for the Pulitzer. These were two guys that at 18 or 19 years old, knew exactly who they wanted to be. Um, and, you know, you can feel a little bit cold and lonely standing in the shadow of people. And I'm sure maybe you guys went to college with these types of people who knew from the moment they started school, this is who I'm going to be and I'm gonna achieve it. And I, I think I was pretty inspired by them to at least take the chance of taking a semester off and going to work in a legitimate restaurant. So that's what I did. My junior year, I dropped out, I packed my Jeep up, I had about 500 bucks in cash. I drove to Florida and around 20 years old, I said, I'm gonna go work at a legit restaurant, which I didn't really know what a legit restaurant was at that point, um, uh, but no one would hire me. So I, the only job I ended up getting was a job at an amusement park. So now I've dropped out of college, I've moved to Florida, I'm working in an amusement park. Um, I moved in with a guy who I worked with at the amusement park, um, who I ended up catching, uh, stealing from me. I had to move out, I was homeless for a few days, I slept on the beach, I ended up living in a boarding house. I finally saved up enough money working at the amusement park to get my own place, and at that point, a bobcat who somebody was keeping as a pet illegally escaped from their house, ran into mine and attacked me. And it was at that point, I was, you know, I was asking the universe <laughs> to, to allow me to open up my own restaurant or to pursue this dream. And I was pretty sure the universe was telling me no at that point. Um, but oh. it, was, it was at that point, I wrote a fake resume uh, and I went to the most fine dining restaurant that was in that area. And I basically, talked myself into a job as a captain. Um, and so I started working at that job and within a couple of weeks, um, I A, realized that I was, I was good at it. Um, and B, I realized that I really loved hospitality. I think a lot of times when people go to school and they study something for a long time and then there's, some, then there's practical application of what they learned, a lot of people are sadly disappointed and sort of heartbroken when they see really what it is that they've been thinking about all this time. I had the opposite effect, which was I had a love affair with it instantly. 
I loved the instant gratification of it. I loved the fact that serving and having my own station was almost like managing my own business every night. And I love the fact that, that, that I kind of controlled the outcome. I could control the pace of it. I could control the tone at a table. Um, my relationship with the kitchen maybe allowed me to get my, uh, my, my food quicker than someone else. It's like figuring out how to navigate all those things within a restaurant. So I, uh, I ended up working like six doubles a week and saving up enough money to open up a little six table restaurant three years later, um, just down the street. And so at age 22, uh, I opened the Lazy Days Cafe, um, which was my very first restaurant. Six tables, pretty much stuck together with bubble gum. Me and my, my girlfriend at the time, she was the chef, I was the front of the house. Um, and uh, it was incredibly modest, but it, it had a lot of heart behind it. Wow. That's an amazing story. Uh, thank you so much for sharing. And everybody heard it here first. You know, we need a movie made about this because your <laughs> life has been a movie practically. Um, super interesting. Wow. I love how you, um, you know, you had a plan for yourself and you really went out and you, know, you didn't know anybody in the industry and have much experience, but you had this plan and you made it known that you were really going to figure it out, which you did. So that's really, really humbling. Well, I, you know, it's funny. People will say, God, that was so risky that you did that. But but honestly, when you look at your lifespan and when you're 20 years old, you really don't have anything to lose at that point. You know, um, you, know you can fail uh, at something that you don't want to do. So you might as well take a chance on, uh, on you know, trying to uh, you know, make life conform to you instead of the other way around. So for me, it was gonna be very easy for me if, if it, things didn't pan out for me to go back to school. Um, so it was a pretty easy decision for me just to go down there and, and give it a shot. And listen, a lot, of, a lot of luck came my way. I met some people that were great mentors, um, some great partners along the way. Um, I picked the right area to go to, an area where at the time was quiet enough that I could make my mistakes um, uh, you know, in a small rural area. Um, and kind of hone my skill. And really that became my kind of bachelor's degree and master's degree was opening up those first couple of restaurants and, and kind of navigating that world and making my mistakes and, and just trying to get better. Well, and over your 20s, you opened numerous restaurants. So you had this first one, it was a staple. It gave you that initial experience you needed. How were you able to manage, you know, a number of uh, restaurants over different states all while in your 20s so you have all these restaurants and you know you're only one person so how were you able to do it well to clarify i didn't have them at the same time i opened my first restaurant lazy days we ended up getting an offer on it and we sold it and so i opened a restaurant down the street that was a wine bar sushi bar rock and roll bar open seven days a week um, I just combined all the things that I liked best. I was like, well, I like live music and I like wine a lot. I really like sushi. Let's make one place out of it. So I opened that and I got another offer. And, but at this point I had to sign a non-compete. So for five years. And so I sold that restaurant and I had to move. So I moved to Springfield, Illinois, and I opened up a bigger restaurant in Springfield. So really it was almost like flipping houses. Um, I, had ambitions beyond these kind of modest places that I was opening. And so every time I sold, it just gave me an opportunity to build something that was bigger. You know, I was still living kind of in squalor and driving really shitty cars. And I would just take whatever money I made and put that back into the next restaurant that I was going to open. So when I opened in Springfield, Illinois, that was the first like real restaurant I opened. That was, it was 130 seats. It was 4,000 square feet. You know, I had a staff of 30 people. Um, to me, that was, you know, I, I had jumped a class at that point and, and it, it, was, it was much more difficult. And then when I sold that, I went to Nashville and I opened up a 10,000 square foot restaurant. Um, and so you guys know what the Peter Principle is, right? No. The Peter Principle is, is you, you basically elevate to your level of incompetency. So just because someone... Uh, was a good class president doesn't necessarily mean there's going to be a good house of rep you know a good congressman 
or a good senator or a good president. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we've, we've seen this historically with people. So for me, I was good at a six table restaurant and I was good at a little wine bar and I was good at a 130 seat restaurant. But when I built a 10,000 square foot restaurant in Nashville with some very big developers, I had quickly reached my level of incompetency at that age. Um, and that was one of the biggest lessons I learned in my 20s was I had been very good about having middle class sensibility, being very much a student still up to that point. And I think after selling Springfield, I had this idea that, well, geez, I, I, this thing's pretty easy. <laughs> I know exactly what to do. And when I went down to Nashville, um, as my mom would later put, put it, I had my feathers a little too high up in the air. And I got down there and, uh, you know, I got, I got squarely punched in the face. Um, I went down there and, and, and there were a lot of things I didn't know still. I didn't know how to control a line within a restaurant that, that really developed a, 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 almost a nightclub scene. I didn't know how to separate the bar from the restaurant. I didn't know how to do that much volume. I didn't know how to manage a staff of 100 people. Um, and so... It was one of the, the harder things that I've ever experienced in my life, that failure. But it was also the, the greatest education I ever got. Because when I, when, I, when I moved to Springfield, which was at the tail end of my, of, of my 20s or the beginning of my 30s, um, I came in with a completely different mindset again, which was remaining a student of the game um, and, 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 and taking a step back and downshifting. We really feel like this is a perfect transition for our next question because we did have an opportunity a few weeks ago to watch an interview that you did a few months ago um, where you were speaking about experience uh, and speaking about how experience is the best teacher, uh, especially while you're in your 20s. If you could touch on that uh, real quick uh, in relation to what you learned uh, through your process and your professional career, that'd be wonderful. Yeah, you know, when you're, when you're building something, especially when you're building a company, um, you know, at some point you're going to have to build infrastructure around you're gonna to have to build a team around you and if you haven't done each of these jobs within the restaurant it's it's impossible for you to mentor anyone it's impossible for you to be a true assessor of whether somebody's doing a good job um, within that particular area and if you look at a if you look at a restaurant specifically we have a critical path which is like the 850 things you have to do to open up a restaurant. And that includes everything from uh, choosing a designer to uh, doing the menu type setting, to writing a wine list, to doing a cocktail list, to having pashminas in a closet in case someone gets cold at a table. Um, and so that list obviously has evolved over the years and it's gotten better as we've learned our craft better in each of these areas. Um, but whenever you're starting out to do anything, I don't think you have to recreate the wheel. And, and most of us are not doing something that's unprecedented. So if you wanna be a great interviewer, for instance, there are some amazing interviewers in the world. You know, from, from Howard Stern to Johnny Carson to um, oh, who's I, 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 the guy's name's escaping me right now. It'll come to me. There's a there's a guy um, who has an internet interview show that's so good that I watch. All Joe the time. Rogan. It's not Joe Rogan, but I like Joe Rogan too. <laughs> um, I'll think of it in a second. His name's Sam, and he's so good. Um, but you know, I think it's important to have a, a, a bar to 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 reach to to know who you would like to emulate in this world and then be a student of that and then try to try to exceed that person um uh so i'm still a student of the game i still love to be blown away when i go to other people's restaurants and i see something that i haven't seen before um i'm uh, I'm, I'm still a student of the at 50 i'm still a student you know yeah, in the restaurant industry, it's, it seems like it's one that is always evolving, always changing, whether it be based on people's tastes or kind of the experience that they want to have at a restaurant. So how would you kind of say that 
or or how would you say the restaurant industry has evolved and what would you say to future restaurant or owners that maybe want to start a restaurant in their 20s because that's a you know that's a big deal to someone in their 20s uh what would you give them for advice what what kind of things would you tell them to stray away from or go right into yeah i i'm pretty lucky because i was kind of born in the golden age of, of restaurants if you look at right before the economic crisis um, restaurants were kind of in two categories. You had very casual restaurants and then you had chef driven restaurants and those chef driven restaurants usually had tablecloths. They were usually expensive. Um, they usually had candles on the tables. And after the economic crisis, what you saw was all these great chefs doing food at a number of different levels, everywhere from fast casual to quick service to shared plate concepts. And what was born out of that was just a higher level of dining at every genre, at every economic point. Um, and that opened up so many doors for a company like mine, um, who, because we weren't really, besides Boca, which is our Michelin starred restaurant, we kind of live in that middle area where it's, it's chef driven food, but it's still accessible for a lot of people. So I, I think that in the last 15 years, that's been, the best evolution of the restaurant business is it's it's is great food that's been sourced locally, served seasonally, um, uh, uh, with with great chefs behind the wheel that's accessible to everyone. That didn't that didn't really exist when I was when I in when I was in my twenties um, as much. Um, and my advice to somebody who wanted to open up their own restaurant um, is you know going back to the learning part of it. Um, is it, it, first you got to find out who you are in the business. You know, if, if, if you do, we have an internship program that we've done with the James Beard Foundation and, and we've, we've done it with people um, uh, who've just reached out to us who wanted to be a part of the restaurant business. I'll give you an example. A, a girl named Julie Rue worked for us. She was a, a, an executive at Microsoft and very successful, but she didn't feel a deep love for what she did at Microsoft. She did feel a deep love for food and hospitality. And she thought that her special skills could be transferable in the restaurant business. And she wrote us a letter. We said, great, why don't we set you up in an internship program where every month you're doing something different. For a month, you're gonna be a server assistant. For a month, you're gonna expedite at a restaurant. You're gonna work in our accounting office for a month. You're gonna do an opening at a hotel with us for a month. You're gonna be Rob and I's assistant for one month. And during that process, not only did we get to see her operate in all those, which by the way, she pretty much kicked ass at everything that she did because she's freaking brilliant. But at the same time, she got to figure out where her love was for it and where she felt the most comfortable inside that game. So my first advice would be, you need to go work at a restaurant. You need to see where your talents lie. And you need to compare yourself to everybody else and see if you can hit a major league curveball. You know, not everybody was built for every single business. Um, I think that you have to have a certain amount of capacity um, for conflict within the restaurant business without losing your cool. If you're not the kind of person who wants to walk up to a table who's very upset about something and can keep the same demeanor the entire time, you kind of have to have the same kind of demeanor that maybe the head FBI negotiator has. <laughs> you know, I don't care how mad you are, Landon, because we just served you uh, nuts and you're allergic to nuts. I'm somehow going to come over to that table and figure out how to get you to a better place. And there's a skill set to that. But it starts with who are you as a person? There are certain people that just can't handle that. My dad could never have handled that. He just was not wired that way. Um, so that's it. Go in, be a student, figure out who you are, figure out who, if you have a great love for it, and then figure out where you fit in in the game. Mm -hmm. well, you know, where I fit in was I liked being an executive producer of all of it. I liked being the Jerry Bruckenheimer of restaurants. I wanted to have a hand a little bit in everything. You know, 
the way the restaurants looked, the way they felt, the way they sounded, the way they tasted, you know, the way we put a team together, the kind of people that I like that live in, in the restaurants. I like to think of each place as its own city. So it's not Boca, it's not Boca in Chicago, Illinois, it's Boca, Illinois. And who are these people that live inside this restaurant? You know, and really at the end of the day, my criteria is, do I like you and do I think you're smart? That's it. That's all I want to know. And do you like to take care of people? That's really the only criteria. Well, I believe everything else can be taught. Love that so much. And also, first off, I do have a nut allergy, so that's very crazy. You said ah. that. <laughs> <laughs> um, but Kevin, I yeah, mean, it's really- We have very good allergy protocols, by the way. That almost <laughs> never happens, but I good have to know. for the table before. Good to know. Oh uh, yeah, because we're coming to a restaurant when we get back to Chicago, but no, that's super nice. interesting to know. Um, but yeah, I mean, we really are just in awe with your philosophy of wearing multiple hats uh, when you want to be a leader at a company. Um, you know, that advice really can be for everybody, not just for people who are interested in getting into, you know, the restaurant industry. We've spoken with so many entrepreneurs, so many founders that are always mentioning like they've, you know, worked every single side of their business. So when they hire people, they know exactly how it needs to be. Um, so thank you for sharing that advice. It's really, really important for people, especially in their 20s, to know um, if they're looking to become the leaders of tomorrow. Um, so in addition to that, on the subject of evolution, we'd love to hear um, on a personal level how your taste buds have changed over the years. You know, your palate in your 20s compared to now. Um, you can take some time to think about that, but we'd love to hear about how that's changed. No, you know, that's really, that's really interesting. I was a fairly simple eater growing up, I think because I was, you know, we didn't have a lot of money. Um, uh, you know, I, I, my, my parents were not gourmands. They, it, we, they served us very simple food. And so when I first started working at restaurants, my pal had a long way to go. I, I, I enjoyed the excitement of it all, but I was like a little kid when I first started. And so, but I was willing to try anything. So I remember working at that first restaurant and, and, and how much my ideas of just what, what great food was expanded working at that restaurant. And then something magical happened for me. My girlfriend at the time took me to have sushi. And that was a moment where I remember that first time that I ate it, I wasn't sure if I liked it or not. And then a week later, I had a mad craving for it. And that began a love affair for me with Japanese food um, that I probably 50 to 60% of the meals that I eat to this day are, are, are Japanese food. I like really clean food. I like great acidity. Um, and so I, I think that, you know, now I like things that shock me more. I think if you go back and look at me when I was 20 years old, my, my, my palate was, you know, it was a very small box. I would go to, a, if, I, if I went to a fancy restaurant, I was always going to get a steak. Um, <laughs> I rarely eat steaks nowadays. Um, so I, I think that I was a sponge and I just wanted to try more and more things. And as I was soaking all that up, I think restaurants were getting more progressive. You know, the first time I ever dined in Alinea, when it opened, that's one of the most progressive restaurants in the world. And that's a restaurant that you go in with the mindset that I'll try anything. Um, you know, I'm gonna put myself in the hands of Grant Ackett so whatever he brings out, I believe is going to be great. Um, but, you know, and I, and I also think that my perception of the things that were crazy when I was in my 20s, nothing within food seems crazy to me anymore. It's all, it's all about building balance on a plate. And so no, no ingredient seems really crazy or left of center to me anymore. I, I'm, I'm not squeamish about any of those things. And with all of these restaurants that you've opened over, over the vast number of years you've been doing this, what was your favorite to open? And, and why was that one different for you? Or how did that create a different experience? You know, so it's pretty, it's pretty easy to answer. Um, when I was uh, when I was 27, I went back to my hometown, and it was I was doing a a a, a large scale restaurant for the first time. Um, at the same time, I was kind of I didn't have a chef involved at the time, so I was 
the designer of the restaurant. I was kind of putting the menu together. Um, I was basically doing all of it. And um, I, you know, from going to find a bar at an old antique store and I refinished it. I bought a whole bunch of old chairs and my mom and I refinished them all and she sewed new seats and all the backs on all of it. I painted the walls. Um, there was an artist that I really liked in New Orleans, but I couldn't afford his paintings. So I, my mom, who was an artist, I asked her to copy all of his paintings. So she painted 17 uh, replications of, of his paintings and, and put them on the wall. Um, I had seen once in a restaurant in New York that um, almost like a trading firm that they had the, the clocks over the bar of the different cities and the different time zones. And I'd put that over the bar. And really, th that restaurant, more than the restaurants I'd done before, was just a direct reflection of everything that existed inside my head of what I thought I wanted a restaurant to be. And when I finished it, when I sat down on that night, uh, uh, about a week before we were going to open, um, it, was, it, was, it was maybe the happiest moment of my life because I was so proud and I was like, this is a, this is a real restaurant. And I had a friend who was a, a chef from Florida who had come up to help me. And when he walked in the door and I could see on his face, he was like, holy shit, man, you opened a real restaurant. Uh, the, Im the immense amount of pride I had for that place. And listen, I've done restaurants that are so much larger of scale with some of the fam most famous chefs and designers in the world since that restaurant. But I don't think it can compare to that feeling that I had at 27 um, when I sat in my hometown and I was just so proud that I had, what I had built inside my head, the rendering that I saw inside my head and what actually came out were basically the same. And, uh, and that restaurant still exists to this day. I don't own it anymore, but it's been open for 23 years. So Kevin, we have one final question for you. Um, it's clear you're the ultimate host. I mean, you really know exactly how to you know, treat people well uh, when they're welcome to join your restaurants and More than dine kind. with you. Um, we really are curious, ultimate best guest or craziest, coolest guest that you've had come to one of your restaurants over the years. Um, someone that you were just taken back by uh, that experience for you, who was that person? Well, I'll tell you, I'll tell you a fun story. Um, so I'm at Momotaro one night and I get a call from the peninsula and they said, hey, the, uh, the Rolling Stones would like to come and have uh, dinner at Momotaro. And I said, okay, yeah, absolutely. We'd love to have them. And they said, well, they're going to send a gentleman ahead who's part of their security team to kind of look at the options of where they could maybe sit. And so he came ahead of time. Um, he, he was clearly a boss. <laughs> Within minutes, I felt like I was working for him. And he was, and I was taking him around to show him all the spots. And he's like, I gave him three different, uh, three different places that they could possibly sit at. One of them was Rob and I's office, which is on the third floor of Momotaro. But there's a glassed in table in the center of the room that they could sit at, very private. So all of a sudden, he goes, stand by the elevator. We had a side door at Momotaro. And in through the door walks Mick Jagger and Ron Wood. And so I hit the elevator button. We go up to my office. Mick and Ron are, 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 are really energetic and friendly and they're having fun. And we walk into my office and Mick's like, this is where we're dining. I don't even need to see the other two places. So I, I, I fix Mick a drink. And I asked Ron if he'd like a drink. And he just said, is there any way you could make me a Red Bull? And I said, absolutely. Well, we don't serve Red Bull. And so, but I know, I knew Nell Coates a few blocks away did. It was 101 degrees that day. And I was in a black suit. I jogged to Nell Coates. I got a six pack of Red Bull. I came back. I was already sweating through my suit. I poured Mr. Wood a Red Bull. And he looked up to me and he goes, I'm sorry, I meant a sugar-free Red Bull. <laughs> so I had to jump back outside, run back to Nelco again. And at this point, it was noticeable how much I was sweating. And I went to pour him the sugar-free Red Bull. And he looked up to me and he said, are you nervous, son? <laughs> he thought that I was sweating because I was so nervous to be in the presence of the Rolling Stones. But um, that story aside, it was an entirely enjoyable experience. They were lovely and charming. 
um, and amazing and had a great time. Uh, and just a few days later, I had, we had the same experience at the same restaurant with you two. Um, <laughs> and so within days of each other, we had the stones in you two and, and, and I remember Bono kind of grabbing me by the shoulders and being like, you man, you should be so impressed. My manager doesn't like any restaurant, but he loves this restaurant. So <laughs> congratulations. That's so cool. And that's the experience you get when you dine with the Boca restaurant group. That's really, really cool. <laughs> that's amazing. Sorry, I'm choking trying to do Bono's voice. <laughs> wow. Those are, uh, we know you probably have a million other cool stories too, but thank you for sharing those two. Those are really, really neat. Of course. Yeah. Um, Michael, did you have any additional questions for Kevin? Kevin, I, I think the, I didn't have any additional questions, but I think that the information you shared today, it truly was something amazing. I think uh, our viewers can grab a lot from it. Not even if they're just starting their own business, but the piece where you were talking about taking on every role and kind of seeing where you fit in. I think that's super important. And I think that's something our listeners, our viewers are going to take really a hold of. Well, <clears throat> I think w one last thing to leave you on what I hope for the world and what I hope for the restaurant industry moving forward is that there's this big bounce in humanity that happens right away. Um, there's been a lot of people who've been isolated. Um, there's been a lot of ugliness in the world this past year. There's been a lot of civil unrest. There's been mm -hmm. a, a, a lot of disagreements politically. Um, I think more than ever, um, we as, as, as Americans, as humans, need to sit at the table again, break bread again together again, look at each other in the eye, be able to share our thoughts with each other. Um, I, I think there's no better place to do that than within a restaurant. Um, it, there's, there's uh, you know, we've got, we've got 18 places that are a nice soft landing for you when, when the world comes back to normal. And I'm, I'm keeping my fingers crossed that that time is very, very soon. Um, and that uh, the 2021 is a gentler, kindler, um, <clears throat> more loving place. Um, uh, and, uh, and, and, and hopefully a, a, a better time and a better place for the restaurant industry. Kevin, it was a pleasure. Thank you so much hey, for everything. Thank today. you. Thank you guys for having me. I appreciate it. Appreciate it. We'll thank stay you, in Kevin. Touch. Cheers, guys. Thank you. Thank you.